Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're taking our weekly look at the numbers, trends, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Irons, let's start by reviewing this week's numbers. What's happening across the country with new cases and deaths from COVID-19? So, Todd, um, the numbers are still going up. We seem to start like that every week um, with this update. Um, currently, the numbers from this morning are 6,520,733 uh, people have been um, identified as having COVID-19, um, and 194,087 people have died from COVID-19. If you look globally, um, more than 29 million people um, have, uh, have been diagnosed and um, over 924,000 deaths. Um, have occurred due to COVID-19. So at this uh, at this rate, we're looking at that you know very significant milestone of 200,000 deaths within what a week. I think so. You know, if you if you look at the seven day average, um, which is always a better a better way of looking at the numbers than daily, um, since they seem to go up and down, especially over weekends. We're still at just under 35,000 deaths per day um, and about, I mean, I'm sorry, just under 35,000 new cases per day and about 734 deaths per day. Um, so at that figure, we're probably looking at seven or eight days um, if things continue the way they are um, to reach that, um, that really sad 200,000. Um, and we are seeing uh, some variations state by state. We see a surge in a place like North Dakota, perhaps driven by uh, the rally there from uh, several weeks ago, but also throughout the Midwest. What can you uh, comment on that? Yeah, so, you know, as you said, um, North Dakota had um, more than 460 new cases um, last week, a single new, uh, a single day record for them. Um, West Virginia, which has been relatively silent, um, is also um, showing a, a new record of more than 300, uh, 340 cases. Um, we're starting to see a mini uptick or I, I hate to use the word surge um, since we've kind of been in this all along, um, but we're starting to see increases in Midwest um, that are felt to be secondary to college campuses, campus increases, um, and also North Dakota um, uh, and South Dakota, um, secondary to the, to the motorcycle rally that occurred there. Well, there have been a couple of pieces of uh, interesting research uh, mm -hmm. over the past week. Well, then we start by talking about the CDC's report about uh, the riskiness involved with restaurant and bar uh, uh, bars. Yeah. So this report um, hit the hit the media last week. Um, you know, the CDT, CDC did a case control study um, where they looked at um, the exposures that were reported by a group of people who were diagnosed as having COVID uh, COVID nineteen and those who were who were symptomatic but not diagnosed as having COVID nineteen. Um, and what they found is, if you looked at the at the people that were COVID positive, um, they were three times more likely likely to have had a contact with someone who was COVID positive, but also more likely about twice, uh, twice as likely to have um, dined in a restaurant or um, gone to a bar or, or a, a, a coffee, a coffee house. Um, now um, you have to um, kind of look at the study closely. They were small numbers. It was a small study and they didn't distinguish in the restaurants, whether it was outdoor dining versus indoor dining um, and the same with bars and coffee houses. But um, they did issue um, a, 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 an interesting risk-based um, analysis of sort of uh, in terms of, of, of restaurant eating, you know, what's low risk and what's high risk that ranges from, you know, takeout to, to curbside pickup to outdoor dining where the, um, where the, um, uh, the tables are far apart um, to indoor, indoor dining with low ventilation with close tables um, as the highest risk. Uh, there's been a, a, an additional study this week uh, regarding young people uh, that came out in JAMA. Why don't you talk a little bit about those results, which have been uh, surprising? Well, they have been. You know, we keep hearing about the fact that young people are less likely to be um, uh, to suffer uh, the severe manifestations of COVID, um, but we're finding out that that isn't it, that, that 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 isn't true anymore. 
Um, and um, there, there is increasing concern in young people. So last week there was a research um, letter that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine for a group from a group in Boston um, that looked at over 3,000 young adults. Now that was defined as the ages of 18 to 34. You know, it was that age range. Um, and they looked at hospitalized young adults and, and, and what occurred, you know, what their clinical course was. And what they found was that one out of five ended up in the ICU um, and one out of 10 um, ended up on ventilators. Um, so, you know, the traditional thinking um, or what we thought early on was that if younger people um, were um, affected with COVID, they were more likely to have mild disease. Um, and that just isn't true. It isn't panning out. Um, we've known that, you know, we've heard of these, uh, heard of these cases, but now the numbers are really, um, we have the evidence to, to prove that. Wow, that is surprising. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the news that came out over this weekend regarding the CDC and questions about whether mm -hmm. there is uh, attempted interference in the reports that are so crucial to tracking what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, um, there have been reports uh, really beginning, I think, on Friday about um, concerns that reports from the CDC um, had been um, uh, amended um, or, or, or changed in some ways before they've been issued. Um, and um, that certainly is concerning. Um, you know, as you know, the AMA from the very beginning of the of the pandemic, starting with Dr. Harris's national address at the at the National Press Center back in April, on the importance of science and decision making, um, really affirmed the fact that we needed evidence based solutions and policies to build societal trust. Um, the AMA has always, from the very beginning, believed that evidence based science and data play an essential role in protecting public health in the face of the COVID pandemic, and we continue to call for an environment in which physicians, scientists, and other experts are free to communicate um, the evidence-based information um, about um, safety and efficacy of drugs and um, other information that we have about the, about the pandemic. Yes, that is incredibly crucial. Um, thank you for the comments there. Uh, let's uh, turn our attention to school openings and the spread uh, that continues to be an issue there. I noticed that at my alma mater undergraduate, uh, Miami University, some trouble there in regard to uh, 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 people breaking the rules. It seems to be an issue at many colleges. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the numbers change daily and they seem to change by a factor of 10 or 100 daily. Um, we're now looking at over 88,000 cases of, of COVID positive um, infections occurring in college campuses nationwide. Um, and they, they tie back to gatherings. You know, it's what we've been talking about from the beginning of the pandemic. It's large gatherings that are occurring um, where the virus is spreading. So at Miami University in Ohio, um, students who knew they tested positive um, hosted a Labor Day party. Um, you know, for, for other students. Um, the University of Wisconsin and Madison moved all of their classes online and they are currently quarantining students in two of their largest dorms. Um, so, you know, the message is still, you know, wear a face mask, for, um, socially distance, wash your hands, and large gatherings are really, are really concerning. Um, mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, uh, on to vaccines, uh, some news there from the AstraZeneca study, which had you know placed pause, but seems to be uh, proceeding there. Can you talk about what you're seeing in those trials? Sure. Um, so I'll start with the AstraZeneca trials. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been in phase three trials in the UK and in um, Brazil. Um, for a while now, um, and it, it entered uh, phase three. They started phase three trials in the United States just within the last month. Um, those were put on pause last week um, because a um, trial participant in the UK um, developed um, some neurologic symptoms um, that were deemed to be um, a serious adverse reaction. Um, and so the, the, the trials were, were put on pause worldwide for, for that vaccine. Um, it was, it actually showed that the, the safety and the data monitoring system works. 
<laughs> um, in, in, in uh, following the data closely and putting those trials on pause. Um, the trials, that trial has actually been re resumed in the UK um, after, um, uh, after review by uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board there and a decision by their equivalent of the FDA that it was safe for the trial to resume. Um, it, we still haven't heard anything about whether, when or whether their trial uh, will resume in the United States. Um, they're starting with the UK first. In terms of the US, there are two, two phase, trial, phase three trials going on. Uh, the Moderna vaccine that's going through the uh, NIH trials network um, has now recruited over 23,000 people, um, well on their way to the 30,000 that they're hoping to recruit. Um, they are still, however, looking for um, minorities because they're trying to recruit all subpopulations of people. And they have recruited uh, currently 22,000% of the people in the trial are from the Latinx community, but only 11,000, I mean, 23%. 22% are in the Latinx community and 11% are in the African American community. Um, so the goal is for the additional or what's left of the 7,000 is really trying to focus on um, communities of color um, so that we have, so that there's um, a good, um, uh, a good representation. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is also in phase three trials. They have recruited over 25,000. Um, people. Um, but once again, 11% Latinx, 8% African American. Um, so the goal is really to increase minority enrollment. Um, and there was a news report just this morning that they have applied to the FDA to actually increase the numbers of their trials um, to 44,000. Um, so still don't know how what the response has been because increasing the numbers has to be approved by the FDA, um, but there's a uh, there's an intent to do that. Well, uh, uh, hard to believe, but there still continue to be misconceptions uh, mm -hmm. out there about prevention and treatment of COVID-19. Uh, can you talk a little bit about a recent poll that highlights some of those problems? Yes, so the, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation um, had a poll um, just last week um, of um, almost uh, 1,200 uh, adults um, that was conducted about two weeks ago, and it found that one in five people believed, still believe that wearing a mask causes health problems, um, and one in four say that hydroxychloroquine is an effective treatment um, for COVID-19. We know that both of those things are not true, um, and so it's just another, um, another reason that physicians really have to be um, talk to their patients about what the evidence supports and what the data supports, um, and that it's important um, to wear a mask, socially distance, wash your hands, um, and do all the right things. Uh, beyond those key messages, is there uh, anything else uh, from the AMA uh, that you'd like people to hear this week? Sure, and you know, just as a uh, as a reminder that um, other other um, other significant health problems continue. You know, and, and last week um, there was research published in JAMA that showed a greater proportion of Americans, particularly communities of color, were living with uncontrolled blood pressure in 2017 and 2018 um, than were previously. Um, so blood pressure control has worsened, um, continues to be a major effort of the AMA, um, and is still a problem. And so the AMA and the American Heart Association re uh, released a joint statement last week reaffirming our commitment to working together to equip physicians and all Americans, particularly communities of color, with resources um, to lower blood pressure, pressure rates across the country. Well, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you being here today and sharing your perspective with us, uh, Dr. Irons. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll see you tomorrow with another segment. For updated resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us and please take care.